just a quick disclaimer before we get into this interview. Um, as out of respect to my guest's family and his wife, especially, uh, we did this interview initially remote due to the pandemic that is currently going on in human malware. Uh, just, just for safety's sake, in the near future, uh, we do have a plan to go specifically to tour uh, his shrimp room. So look forward to that. But without any further ado, I really want to jump into this interview because I think you guys are really going to love it. Uh, the community voted to have this completely unedited. So you're getting the whole conversation. No edits whatsoever, including the spot where I joke. We'll edit that out. So <laughs> oh, enjoy. This is a little bit of a long one. So maybe just like put it on in the background, start doing some water changes. Um, you know, there's not a, a ton of B-roll. There's some cool B-roll at some point, but check it out. Enjoy. Have fun. Hello, everyone. This is Bentley, and today I have a very special guest. This is Nick from ShrimpyBusiness.com, and we're going to talk a couple of things. One... Uh, Nick is a really, really awesome dude, just in general, but two, I want to talk Nick with you about how you kind of first came into the fish hobby and then eventually got into shrimp because in the grand scheme of things, shrimp haven't been super popular, at least in the United States up until what last decade, last mm -hmm. five years, really five years is where it's really caught on to me, it seems. And then yep. how you went from just being a hobbyist into running a business dedicated to shrimp yeah so first so, yeah first, where'd you start yeah so first of all thanks Bentley, for having me on i really appreciate appreciate that um been a fan of your channel for for a while for you know to check out your videos here and there so thanks, really fan of your channel <laughs> um so yeah so i guess my fish keeping hobby i started off with fish like most people um i guess it started when i was you know a little kid in, in elementary school so i grew up in singapore um, so I started off with beta. So that was my first fish love, I guess you could say. Nice. Um, so I remember as a kid, you know, just like my first beta, probably when I was, uh, in fifth grade, fifth or sixth grade, I think. So I just fell in love with it. I like, I love the character, I know, and, and I love the fact that, you know, they, they have that aggressive nature to them, you know, they flare with each other. Um, and then, you know, I remember in school that, you know, it was really, you know, <laughs> before, before school started, they had this, you know, bunch of kids brought their little fighting, you know, fighting fish or beta to school and then they flare against each other and then we kind of have, have bets. I know we're betting at, you know, at elementary school, which is not great, but <laughs> <laughs> nothing too serious. Um, but it was fun times, man. I was just, you know, that's, that's how, that's how, you know, I got started, I guess, keeping fish. And then I started trying to figure out how to breed them, right? So. Um, and back then the internet wasn't, you know, that great. So we, we, you know, I got books and then try, you know, we just get the, as much information as possible, try and error. You know, I remember getting just tubs from my, my, my parents, you know, after, you know, I was a kid, I didn't have any money. Right. So I got, I got tubs from my parents after, you know, they finish, finish eating like maybe a yogurt or something and I washed it out really good. And so I kept a beta in it. Right. And then. And then I, I, I you know, threw a female in there and see what happens. And then, you know, obviously I got eggs. And then after that, I was, I was like, okay, how do I take care of it? I didn't make it. So that, that kind of, you know, I guess that first failure kind of gave me the, the itch to try to figure out how to do it. So yeah. I eventually figured out how to, how to breed them. And then fast forward, I guess a few months or so I had, you know, my first my first real uh, batch going um, and I had, you know, like two, 300 betas just outside my parents' backyard because it's in Singapore, <laughs> you know, it's tropical all year round. Um, and yeah. then I didn't deal with them because, you know, there's so, you know, what do you do with two, 300 fish and you can't keep them in one tank. Um, so I started selling them to, you know, just real cheap to friends because they wanted to keep them too. And then I, I went to my fish store, right, I, which I go frequent probably every week. I would say every day. I would go there every day. If I'm not buying anything, I'm just looking at it, <laughs> looking at fish, um, and just admiring their, admiring the the guy's tanks. But I, I'm glad the guy, I'm glad the fish store owner didn't mind just me hanging out with him and just staring at his fish. Um, 
but one day I just asked, you know, the, the fish store owner, I said, hey, you know, would you want some beta? And he was like, yeah, sure, bring a couple over and, and let's see what we can do. And then and I brought a couple over, you know, they were, they were relatively nice. Not the you know, common bill tails, but for like, you know, Delta, Half Moons, like the nicer, nicer ones. And he said, like, yeah, sure, you know, I'll pay you, you know, X amount for them. I said, yeah, sounds good. So I, I sold my, you know, I sold my, my first batch of, you know, fry to him. And then, you know, I just kept doing it. <laughs> so, I, I mean, just, I know. how yeah. old do you think you were when you sold your first batch of fish? Probably 12. 12? All yeah, right. So already yeah. at 12, kind of starting that little entrepreneurial side. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know what that itch was, right? I didn't know what, what that was back then because I, I, I was like, hey, hey, I'm, I'm selling you stuff that, you know, I, I'm really you know, proud of that first batch, right? And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really passionate about what I was doing. But I'm like, hey, I don't mind getting paid for something that I love doing. You know, it's, it makes sense. Obviously, I wasn't making, you know, I wasn't like going to retire or anything, but it was... You know, as a kid, you know, you know, a buck, a buck or two, buck, a buck of fish, you know, that's pretty big money for for a kid, like two hundred bucks, you know, it's a lot of money for a choyo at the time. Um, so you know, I just kept kept on doing it. Um, I found a couple of other fish store owners that were like that, they liked, you know, the the fish I was producing. Um, so it's kind of cool. It was it was a, basically a self funding hobby. You know, I got nice 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 uh, breeder pairs from them. Um, and I gave them, you know, I sold them fish. So it was, it was a great trade, you know, at, at that time. Cool. Um, so I started doing this. Um, I stopped for a while here and there, um, breeding wise, but I always kept, I always kept betas and I went on to goldfish. Um, never really went on breeding goldfish. Cause I mean, you need a lot of, you know, need a lot of tank space. And I think I remember, remember I only had like two fish tank wise. I only had like two, maybe maybe 20 gallon and a 29 gallon, I think, if I can remember vaguely. Um, then I went on to um, angelfish for a little bit. Um, and then fast forward, um, we we moved to the States when I was um, just my, I guess, last year of high school, so I graduated high school, um, moved, moved to the States, uh, moved to Houston. Um, and then when I was going to college, uh, I didn't I didn't keep anything. Obviously, we sold everything. I didn't I didn't bring any of my fish over, um, and I had an itch to keep um, betas again. So back then, the the craze the craze was uh, giant betas. It was it first came mm. out. You know, you know uh, it's really expensive, really exclusive. So I was like, oh, I know, I'm just going to try to, I you know, figure out how to how to breed them, right? Um, so obviously, the pairs weren't cheap. Um, so I, but that was my first time importing fish. Um, so uh, I got, I went on Equibit, like I guess most people um, who, who, who imports fish for the first time. Um, so I got my first few pairs and I got a couple of giants. I got a few nice half moons. Um, and then I, I just started con slowly converting my parents' garage into a, a like a beta farm. <laughs> I know my parents. My parents love love my hobby. I'm being sarcastic. They, <laughs> they 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 know when I when I start. I kind of go a little bit overboard. Um, so I mean, I started off with you know three four pairs. I think. Um, so I, I I met this nice lady from Thailand. Um, so she she she's the one who supplied me the pairs. And obviously a small amounts. So I went through a trans shipper. Um, so. Um, it was really easy. So I got them and then I started breeding them, selling them on Equibid. A um, little bit more than a dollar <laughs> when I first started. Um, I'd hope so. <laughs> yeah, more than a dollar. Um, but um, no, we, I, I figured out how to breed like the, you know, the half moons and crown tails and all that cool, cool stuff. Uh, but the, the, the giants, I just couldn't figure them out because just speaking with the breeder, they, they needed a lot of space. So they basically bred them in ponds. Oh, and the temperature interesting. had to be right. Yeah, the the temperature had to be right. The the uh, they need a lot of space. You basically fed fed them twice the amount you do with, with normal the normal uh, betas. Hmm. So it was really hard to figure out, especially at the time where, you know, I didn't have uh, the the luxury to put like a you know heat pump in my garage to heat the whole garage. You know, to own a little cup. So I was kind of limited that way. But we kind of I kind of figured out how to you know have ten pre ten ten breeding pairs. 
in my grow up tanks, and then my grow up um, juveniles, they're basically all on the floor during the summer. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to breed my own food. So I had a, da- I had, I had a couple of Daphnia ponds in the backyard. Um, so I was breeding my own food to supply to, to feed, to feed the, the betas um, so I didn't have to buy, buy, buy food. So I was kind of under- understanding how to, you know, I guess, reduce my running costs at the time. Yeah, become, become a little more self-sufficient. A little, bit, a little bit more self-sufficient. So uh, at this point, yeah. uh, I will ask you, uh, the, yeah. the parents who absolutely love having their garage taken over, yeah. how yeah. many, you said 10 breeding pairs, right? Yeah. How many, like, I imagine you had like small like water bottles or cups or something, containers yeah. for the fry. How yeah. many small containers do you think you had outside oh, of like the, bre- the larger breeding pair tanks that are like, you know, five to 10 yeah. gallons or whatever? Right. So we had, I had my... My breeding tanks were about five to ten gallons. My grow up tanks were about forty gallons, and then obviously they, you can't keep the males together for for a long right? Around two months, I remember. Uh, yeah, two months. I had to separate them out. Um, so I had about maybe two to three thousand betas. I would submit in the garage. <laughs> yeah, two to three thousand betas. <laughs> yeah. How, so, how? Let me ask you this: Like, how often are you moving? Like, how how often are you moving? fish by spawn like how 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 many spawns were you handling at a yeah. time and so, like how many fish are we talking because you're still right. like college age basically at this point yeah, where you're doing I this about, I was about 18 19 <laughs> yeah oh, 18 19 um so i kind of had to stage them out so i had 10 breeding pairs i think i had i i had three i could handle three to four batches at one time and each oh each gosh. batch each batch was pretty successful. So I had about three to five hundred fry. Right. Wow. Starting out. And then after that I had to call them. Um, but then through the culling process I had I found a um uh I, well he found me I found a, a customer in Canada of all places. And he reached out to me and said, Hey, you know, how much do you wanna sell me your calls? I'm like I'll, I'll I mean, I'll give you, you know, fifty cents, you know, I don't know. It's something I forgot how much I sold him for, but really cheap. So soon I was keeping my calls, right? So I had a call tank. Um, so that's 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 a part of the reason why I had so one of the reason why I had so many because I found customers for my calls. So I, you know, I thought I I thought in my head, okay, let's try it out. Let's keep my calls because I can't possibly handle you know that many betas and cups. So I sold him like really small calls, and mm-hmm. he he was pretty happy with them. So I mean, hey, I mean, so you basically end up with with no waste at this point. With no waste, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, so it started working out. So, because most beta breeders, they you know they usually call their fish, you know, um, around. Well, I, when I was doing it, around like you know two, I don't know a month, you could tell which are the keepers, okay, and which are not so desirable, and then you do another one at six weeks, and then at eight weeks, you know which ones are your keepers, and then maybe you keep, I don't know, ten to twenty percent of of the batch. That's kind of how. I was in my head. I was gonna do it because I'm, I'm thinking I'm not gonna have three, you know, three thousand betas in my garage. But it just it happened. Um, but then when this guy reached out, you know, so I stopped calling and I kept, you know, I had I kept a call tank and then I kind of kept the desirable ones, you know, to take pictures of and sell. Um, so and then so, yeah, at, at this point, like your your calls are going to Canada. Yeah. For all your your choice, is that purely Aquabid or were you doing like local stores as well? Yeah, um, I was doing so for my keepers. I was doing purely online, so okay. eBay, uh, Aquabid, um, just because I found it uh, more efficient. You know, and at that time, you know, I didn't have, you know, I didn't. I was a broke college kid, right? So I didn't have. Um, I had a I had a car, but I, mean, I didn't want to pay for gas. So I was trying to save as much as possible, mm-hmm. and I was paying my parents' rent too because. Their their agreement was you're gonna take over you know basically half a house you're gonna pay us rent so I was like yeah sure I'll pay your rent so um, I was trying to cut as much cost as possible and being you know the e-commerce you know, it's not as big as it was it is today but it yeah. kind of start started out you know um, back then um, and and yeah but sooner or later I started to realize that for betas and you know in Houston is hot in the summer but it does get cold in the winter and you need to keep the betas around like you know, 78, 80 degrees um, for them to be happy and breeding. And, you know, it just wasn't sustainable. And I got really tired because it was just on my own. You know, 
I, I mean, I, ha- I employed some other um, middle school kids in the summer to help a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, feeding and, and packing and stuff like that. So, but then it got it got pretty tiring, and I, I don't think it was sustainable because I was going to school at the time. So I decided, hey, um, this little profit I'm making is not really worth it. I mean, breeding fish is fun, but I think I'm I think that it's time to to um, to focus on school. So I kind of um, stopped that stopped the business for a while, and my parents were really happy <laughs> because they had their garage back. <laughs> um, and then, I, but then I, I wanted to, you know, breed, breed fish just on a smaller scale. So I started with angel fish. So angel fish, I had, you know, just two breeding pairs going on. I sold them to pet stores. Um, so I don't know the, the trend now. Just reflecting back, has always been, oh, let's figure this out. Oh wait, I can make money with it. And it's, you know, I really enjoy doing this. So let's <laughs> let's try it. Let's try to make it work. I guess looking back now, I always had that entrepreneurial bug. I didn't know what it was back then. So but I always enjoy doing that. Yeah, you you went to college. You you were doing a fish business. How many hours when you were doing the fish business before you finally like you know this is too much. I need to focus on school. How many yeah. hours a week do you think you were dedicating? Oh my god, to um, the fish outside of school because I mean you're a full time student at the same yeah, time, right? Right. So I had to. I mean, I had to feed the fry three times a day. So oh wow. So like, yeah, you can. I, I mean, I guess you can imagine. I woke up at five a.m. every day to feed. To feed the fry, um, and then um, I went get do my you know go to class, come back, um, feed the fry you know feed the fry again um, with brine shrimp. So I always had brine shrimp going, and then I come back in the evening because I oh, I also helped out my parents' store too because my parents had small businesses. So I worked at my parents' store in the evening, and then uh, I, I came back and feed the fish again. So it was, it was tiring because I had I was training my parents to running this business and then I had to go I had to go to school as well. And so, and just because I we've talked about this before, but what's yeah. your degree? Because your degree isn't exactly easy either. Yeah, I was I was pursuing chemical engineering. <laughs> yeah. So in in, in like in Houston, like, you know, ninety percent of folks are in oil and gas. Um. So so it was, it was not only that. Well, I enjoy engineering at you know at the time, so I kind of pursued that. So, so yeah, it, it, we're not even much. we're not even to your like really official business yet, right? Yeah. And already you're helping out with family business, running a fish business, pursuing a chemical engineering degree all at the same time. Yeah. So that is just yeah. a lesson for you folks that are watching who are thinking, I, I might want to open a fish store. Do you have that dedication? <laughs> you might need that dedication. And we're not even started all the way yet. So you, you quit for a little bit. What brought yeah. you back? Yeah. So sorry, let me go. Sip of water. Oh, yeah, go ahead. We can edit this part out. Okay, cool. <laughs> so um, so I, I kind of stopped. Yeah, I stopped the fish business. And then um, um, and then kind of towards, towards the end of my degree, I had a call back from uh, Singapore. Because Singapore has a mandatory military service. So I went back to Singapore. Um, so I couldn't keep fish, obviously, in, in Singapore because I was in the military. But, you know, my, my brother-in-law at the time was keeping, you know, he was in kind of into nano tanks. So he had this little, I would say, maybe five gallon, two and a half gallon tanks. Hmm. And he had some moss and some shrimp in there. So I was like, I asked him one day, so like, hey, how much you pay for for the shrimp and the setup? And he told me how much you pay for them. I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind of crazy. Why would anyone pay that much money for such more shrimp? <laughs> I mean, they were really cool looking, you know. I really, I, I mean, I understand the, the why people were drawn to it because it's small, um, and and you didn't take up that much space on, you know, and and you could keep cool looking creatures in your tank, you know, and and they, I mean, and and they were really and they they breed and you know it's just really cool to watch. Um, but I just, I mean, that that kind of planted the idea in my head, um, because you know, shrimp started in Asia, started in Taiwan, right, and then. Singapore is really close to Taiwan, so they naturally they they got they got the hit start of the hobby as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so we got a lot of you know shrimp eaters in Singapore today. Um, but sooner or later, you know, it was not only natural for that hobby to, to spread across um, to the states. Um, so fast forward, uh, came back to the states. Um, I got a job in the oil and gas company, an, uh, an oil and gas company. Um, 
so that kind of brought me up to to Washington, okay. in the greater greater Seattle area. Um, so I had a real itch to start an aquarium again. <laughs> um, so because now I could right after the, uh, the military. So um, I started a tank with uh, guppies and some corridors. Nice. And then um, love cor- love my corridors. They're awesome. Um, so I bred. Naturally, I figured out how to breed bre- the corridors. So I bred the corridors. I sold them to pet stores. <laughs> Um, cause I guess that's just what I do. <laughs> Have we noticed a pattern yet, folks? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm, people call me crazy, which I don't blame them. I think I am a little, I think you gotta be a little bit, a little bit crazy to do this and, and then keep, keep doing it over and over again. Yeah. And then one, one day, um, I stumbled a video on, on YouTube, you know, showing how to breed, you know, how to breed for profit. And they were like, Oh, let's keep guppies with shrimp. I'm like, Hmm. Never really dabbled with shrimp before. I always made fun of my brother. No, no, not made fun, but made fun of folks that keep shrimp, actually, when they first shot. I'm like, you, you know how much you're paying for these guys? You're so small. And then I know I know, I know, know that was going to come and bite me, you know, in the future. <laughs> I bought my first batch of shrimp. <laughs> so I started a shrimp tank, just some cherry shrimp. Um, and, then, uh, and then they all died. So I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> what happened? So, um, so naturally, when, when things doesn't work out, it kind of, you know, it kind of lit that fire in me to try to figure it, it out, right? So, I guess the engineering side of me kind of kicked in. Um, so, I I went online and I figured out what I did wrong. I set a tank up for you know crystal red shrimp, which are caridinas and ethrunios in there without drip acclimating them and that kind of stuff. And it was it was winter, so they came in at you know basically 50 degrees in the bag, and I just, I just plopped them into the tank. I was like, okay, yeah, that's, that's why they died. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I I tried again, right? So I bought I bought a new batch of shrimp, and then I drip acclimated them, and then like I was like, this is gonna be so cool, and they all died. So so sooner or later, uh, I kind of figured out you know the water parameters and the the right things to look out for for shrimp, because shrimp and fish, you know, they they. They require certain things that fish may not, you know, may not be affected by, like you know, GH cage and mm-hmm. more, a little bit more sensitive to temperature and stuff like that. So, so I, sooner or later I figured it out. So I had my guppy slash um, shrimp tank. So I had a separate shrimp tank, and then once I figured out that shrimp tank, I threw some shrimp into the guppy tank, and I had my guppy slash shrimp tank. So I started selling guppies and shrimp to uh, you know, the local stores in the area. I had one really close to work, so it, it, it really it it, it um. It, it makes sense to kind of, it was easy to, to supply them the, the shrimp and the guppies. Um, so I came, I came up, kind of went to a crossroads where, you know, I was really, I was, I was you know, I was happy with my, my job at the time, you know, and, but I was kind of had that, you know, folks at work were great, um, but I was just really had the itch again to, you know, to start something on my own. Um, because obviously I started, uh, started a few, a few, well, tried to start a few businesses as a kid, but just weren't that successful. But I think just reflecting back, that really gave me the you know, few lessons to learn here and there to, mm. to, to make it, to make it right, you know, to try to, to start again and hopefully um, be successful, you know. So one day I was sitting, you know, just watching TV with my wife and she was like, hey, you know, you have like a ton of shrimp in your tank and you know at a time the my local stores in the area had you know had a bunch of shrimp and didn't eat, didn't eat my shrimp so he was like why do you just sell them online like you did when you were a kid uh well i guess when i was in college so so i was like hmm didn't really think of that but then yeah sure why why don't we give it a shot so i had about maybe four maybe 400 cherry shrimp in my um 10 gallon tank they were just going nuts jeez oh, and <clears throat> yeah, so I had a, had a whole bunch of shrimp and didn't know what to do with it. So I, I, you know, I took a few pictures. I bought a little macro lens clip. You know, I was so glad that technology came away because now you can just put a macro lens clip on on your phone. Versus back then, I had to get a special camera to chase my beta around. Yeah. So it was a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, definitely a lot easier um, now than it was before. Um, so yeah, I took pictures, put them on eBay, and then fast forward two weeks, I sold. I sold all of them, you know. So I was like, hmm. You know, I was really surprised of the demand um, that was growing in the States. So I did, did some other research and I found out, hmm, okay, maybe this 
the, the, the demand in the States is, is growing so quickly, maybe there's something here. And I really enjoy, you know, the shrimp at the time. So I, I got a couple more Caridina tanks. I started, you know, blue boats and crystal reds, and then I started putting them on, putting them on eBay. And then I eventually sold sold them not as quickly as the cherries because there's not many people playing our Caridinas as as, as the new Caridinas. But I mean, yeah. I sold them eventually. So um, I was just really surprised at the demand at the time. Um, so one day I was just watching a few YouTube videos again on the shrimp. <laughs> And then I kind of got inspired. I was like, hey, if I can't breed them, you know, quick enough, why don't we try importing them and see how it goes? Um, so, so that's what we did. You know, I tried the imp- figuring it out was so difficult because, you know, there's not many websites online that basically tell you how to import live animals into the States, right? I mean, mm-hmm. there are, but they're not as detailed as you think you would, they, they're supposed to be. So, um, we brought in our, you know, first small little batch of shrimp. Um, and then in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, if we break even with this batch. Um, I think there's something there because I mean, I'm probably gonna lose a lot of them. I'm trying to learn the quarantine process and you know, every, you know, importing shrimp is very different from importing fish yeah. and, and scents, you know, so they're, they're pretty sensitive, um, compared to most fish, I would say importing fish, some fish are pretty sensitive as well, but anyway, I got them in, um, we lost a lot of them, and my goal coming in was to supply folks with, you know, healthy shrimp. So I know there are folks that come, you know, bring the shrimp in, flip them the next day, and then get the profit. Well, in my mind, that's not sustainable because putting myself in the, in the customer shoes, which I was a customer for a very long time, I kind of knew how I would like to be treated as a customer, and that's the product that I would like to receive. So I definitely would want to supply healthy healthy shrimp so i got the shrimp in and i we quarantined our first batch for a long time um just to make sure they're stable obviously we lost a bunch because you know we were learning at the time mm-hmm. we, we, um well now we now now you know looking back we learned a lot as far as how to treat them how to quarantine them the water parameters for them um so we're a lot better at it now but back then you know i didn't know we don't know anything right so i just brought in, brought in a whole bunch and then quarantined them and then once they were stable, we started selling them, and we, we sold every single one. And we made a little bit <laughs> on the business side, but so I thought that was a win, right? Because we yeah. lost a lot of first batch. Yeah, we didn't lose money, so so I thought that I saw the potential there. So let me ask you this: uh, how how long ago did you start shrimp? That first f- failure, right? Of I I put Neo Caradina in a tank meant for crystal shrimp yeah. parameters. How long ago was that? Up until you sold your first cherries on eBay. Um, so I started a hobby pretty, not too long ago actually. So that was maybe four years, four and a half years ago. Okay. So my, my first first shrimp, um, and then put it on eBay probably maybe a year after keeping okay. keeping them. And then how long between the first realization of like. I had four or five hundred shrimp. They're gone in two weeks. To trying your first import order. Yeah, so we tried our first import order. Um, let me think. Year, I would say maybe two years ago. So, okay. so probably around. I don't know when I get my timeline. So right basically, now. like your third year of doing and anything third. with shrimp, you started importing. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy. You, you, but it's crazy. But at the same yeah. time, like you have this history of figuring out how to be profitable with fish. So yeah. in the back of the head, there's something. It's just kind of figuring out, like you said, that engineering of the last couple of puzzle yeah. pieces to make it shrimp instead yeah. of fish. Right. Right. Okay. So, so yeah. two years ago, we're we're looking at basically first import order, roughly speaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How how long from that point to where instead of, you know, eBay, Aquabid, the the usual online haunts for, you know, hobbyists until you finally like, you know, I just need to make my own website. Yeah. So I from from the start I knew I knew I needed to start my own website because I wasn't going to be um I didn't want the eBay algorithm or, you know, or 
maybe the Amazon search algorithm to be, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to be subject to that because they mm -hmm. can just change the algorithm one day and then I'll be ranked, you know. Yeah, literally at a whim. Uh, literally at a whim, you know, like for our, like we brought in Cherry Shrimp the first, first, first one just to, just to see whether it works. I, I saw my first batch of Cherry Shrimp just because it ranked number one for the, you know, for, for two months. And then after two months, uh, the algorithm changed. They wanted to give another supplier a shot and we were bumped down off the first page. So I didn't want to be subject to that, you know, subject to the algorithm. So I knew I needed to figure out how to, you know, start my own website and understand the e-commerce side of things, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of people in, in who start off um, doing this. And then there's a lot of people who I'm, I'm not the only one. There's many folks who realize that the, the demand and they want to get into into the business side as well. Um, they find it, they find it hard to to figure it out because it's really not easy, and you need capital to do it, right? Yeah. So I was fortunate enough to have a have a good job, and we we were we were smart with our money, and we we you know we saved up a little bit. So I knew I needed to put in a little bit of capital into into the business if I wanted to be successful. Um, so yeah, so I think timeline wise, it was when we dropped out the first page of of ebay which is like i guess two months after our, our first import order um wow. that i knew i needed to start our website so so i started my website i didn't know anything you know my background is chemical engineering it's not computer science it's not coding i didn't know how to code i didn't know anything but then a lot of i mean i'm not gonna lie there were certain days or certain weeks that i was just staring at it. i'm like why am i not getting any traffic to my site you know and why am i is this really what i want to do is this is this is this going to work um but then i had fortunately i had a very encouraging wife um and and we were um we're, we're pretty strong in our faith we we're, we're both christians so we, we, we prayed and we, we felt that this was the right right thing to do so we we kind of you know pursued that um and and sooner or later i mean it's a lot of trial and error i'm i'm not going to go into the details of as far as how yeah that you know I don't think that's the part that people are interested in. It's like, yeah, yeah, how yeah. do you get traffic to your website? I think that's a very right. different concept entirely. <laughs> so many. I mean, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not an e-commerce nerd. I guess you can call me because I, I really. Enjoy, I realize going through that process. I love e-commerce. I love. I I, I love um, you know sending things online and figuring out how the you know how consumerism work. Um, so, but yeah, fast forward. Long story short, kind of figured that out, and we're. And it, we became, sem you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, you know, we're, you know, we, we, we're making, we're making bank, whatever. But I guess it, it was, it came to a point where um, we were, I was surprised as far as the success we've, we've been getting mm -hmm. um, and the support we've been getting. I mean, to those who are watching, who are our customers, I thank you, firstly, um, for being, uh, supporting us. Um, we, we've been getting a really, um, really really cool customers and really loyal customers who be, who keep supporting us so we're really fortunate to to build that brand and build that um that customer base for sure um because it's not easy but um definitely without our customers we won't we won't you know i we won't be able to do this you know so yeah for sure yeah so let's let's talk about that now you've got your your business kind of established and for for those that are, are watching, you more than likely saw the thumbnail, and that's your shrimp room, which is a picture that you posted on Facebook, and I saw in a local Facebook group because before that we we really didn't know each other at all yeah. as far as like face to face or talking, and right. uh, my my immediate instinct after seeing your picture of your shrimp room was like I need to talk to this guy right now <laughs> because one, it's real clean. And two, you had mentioned like, oh yeah, we just moved to this place. It's only been up for like two weeks. Yeah. Uh, and so I kind of like started talking to you. We talked back and forth. I dug in a little bit. Um, I'm sitting with a cart open on my other monitor over here on your website. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so for, for those that were in my live stream uh, a little while back, I asked you orange or yellow. That should tell you what what's going down. And, and Nick knows about this. We talked a little bit before, but um so let's let's talk just a little bit about what sets you apart from, say, the bigger shrimp guys yeah. out there, because you're to a point of where how long how long have you been 
purely in your business? Because you're self-sustained now at this point where you do purely your shrimp business, correct? Yes. So I do this and, and I do I do other things as well, but this is this is my main main business that I focus on. Um, so um, I quit my job in July last year to focus on on the business 100%. So it's been a little, a little bit over a year. Wow. Well, first, yeah. congratulations. I Thank think, you. I think that's a that's a big dream for a lot of fish nerds is to be able to have their own self sustained fish business, and that's yeah. Kind of yeah. every time I get to meet somebody who's done that, because like I'm I'm very different in that my approach is more uh, education as opposed mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. commerce, right? Like mm-hmm. I I'm not the person that's going to run a fish store. Sorry, folks. <laughs> if anybody's hoping that's not happening, I'm not that guy. Um, I would rather meet awesome people like Nick here who do run their own versions of the fish store, in this case, the shrimp store. Um, Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about what sets you apart in, in your eyes. And and maybe it could be customer feedback you've had too, that, that you feel sets you apart from um, large company X. Like we don't need to name names. We're not, we're not trying to trash anybody because like, you know, there are plenty of right. bigger, bigger folks out there that I, I like quite a lot. I think they're wonderful people, but yeah, what you're a small business, what sets you apart and what keeps yeah. those people coming back? Right. So, um, yeah, like you said, there are a lot of big players out there and, and not to, not to talk smack about them. I mean, I've been a customer for them, you know, for a few of them and nothing, nothing, nothing bad to say about them. Um, but I guess what sets us apart is one, we are a small business. We are, you know, family owned. Um, and, and I think that allows us to provide that you know personal touch mm-hmm. that most of the big boys um i guess aren't, aren't unable to provide um because i respond to every single customer on my own because i think that's you know we can we can um outsource packaging we can outsource as far as employing folks to do all that for us but i guess on the customer service side um i that's I'm, that's what i'm really passionate about because when i was a customer that's what i found that could you know, could be improved from from my experiences. So, um, not to say that you know other companies, other companies are horrible. Again, it's just from my experiences, I felt I knew what, as a customer, what I was looking for, um, and I definitely want to provide that for our customers now. You know, being a business. Yeah. Um, so I'm also very passionate about education. So I definitely have a few blogs lined up that I wrote myself, as far as educating the customer to help them be successful. Um, so we definitely want to build that relationship with the customer and to make sure that they're successful on their end and their, their experience, you know, they're happy with the product that they received, uh, and they're, and they're successful in the long run. Cause at the end of the day, um, business is one thing, but I think the goal of mine starting this, this, you know, shipping business is to provide folks the joy and, and you know, and the f- fulfillment of, you know, keeping, you know, shrimp as a hobby and, you know, nano tanks in general. Well, um, I'm, I might be your perfect use case here soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for, for, for the audience, um, let's, let's talk. I want to talk like two or three things on your website real fast. And then yeah. tune in next week. Cause although we're doing this all in one weekend, next week will be a, uh, a tips and tricks video from Nick, where we're going to talk about some really great advice on how to be successful with three different types of shrimp. Right. So speaking of that, let's cover those three because you carry a type of shrimp that I think is very interesting, but also is only really kind of starting to touch the hobby in the U.S. here. Mm-hmm. But we'll we'll save the best for last, right? So in your your neo caradinas, which that's what I've tried the most of. I haven't tried any caradina species other than yep. I guess uh, technically a mono shrimp, right? Because they are a caradina. Mm-hmm. Now. I, I'm looking at some specific stuff, but mm-hmm. out of the neos, what is like your your favorite? What's that thing right. for you? And I, I know the spoiler, I know the secret sauce here, but yeah. I, I want people to get to know you a little bit. What's sure. when you look at a neo? What is the thing that catches your eye right away? Oh man, um, so so my favorite color is blue. Um, I've always been attracted to blue, um, so. My, my blue dreams or dream blue velvets, which you have on the side, um, they're definitely my my favorite just because it's my favorite color. And, you know, they they pop on white substrate, they pop on black substrate, they, they just, they're so versatile. 
mm-hmm. uh, as far as else. because some some neos they you know they the darker color ones they just don't pop as well on you know on, on lighter substrate and you know vice versa because they they adapt their colors to the substrate they're, they're on yeah um but blue has always been my favorite color has always been my so has always been my first love so i think um that's definitely my favorite shrimp but i mean they're all great shrimp to keep but personally if i were to keep one tank it'd be blue okay and then let me yeah. of of the just because you've been doing shrimp longer than me and i'm i keep mostly rainbow fish which think that shrimp are just <laughs> a delicious snack and not a pet right <laughs> um <laughs> Is what's what sells the most for you as a business? Um, you know, is it is it cherries? Is it like secretly it's green because that's the newest one, or or what? Out of Neo Caradinas, what do you see people yeah. buy the most? So we sell we sell a Skittle pack. Um, so that's that's um, it's a pack of ten or five shrimp um, for you know that has three three colors of our choosing. Because we found that folks who keep shrimp love, you know, love the variety, right? They love to have, you know, multicolored shrimp in their in their aquarium, which which is really cool looking. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously, the the you know, folks who've been a hobby uh, a little bit longer, they realize, okay, if I keep too many neos in, in in the tank with different colors, they're crossbreed and produce wild type neo caratina, which are a little bit browny shrimp. So, um, but folks, I guess who who want to keep skittle tank, that's typically not the goal of you know their goal is not to line breed. Um, their goal is to have nice color shrimp in their aquarium, mm-hmm. and uh, we understand that. And we always provide, you know, th- we, we try to provide all females just so that they don't get any, you know, line breeding going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but then again, if if you know wild types are produced, it's not a big deal. They usually have a cow tank that they can take out just to maintain the look of the tank. Um, so that's actually surprisingly what we sell the most. Okay. The green jays do really well too, just because you know we. I, I tried many suppliers to find the right green jade or right greater green jade that we're happy with. Mm. And I'm glad we found um, a breeder that produces the grade that, that meets our standards. Um, so there's not many nice green jades out in the market just because, you know, like you said, they're the new kid on the block. Um, so yeah. there's a lot of people who, who, um, who come to us for the green jays too. And, and I know this from us talking and we'll probably talk about yeah. it at some point, but so most of the green jades, whenever I see them, they're more of like a dull kind of olive color. Where if I'm yeah. looking at your site, which, like I said, it's on my other monitor, I just like glance over. Yeah. Uh, which, one, the fact that you do all your photography on a cell phone with a little clip-on <laughs> macro lens, it is impressive how good your photography is for your website. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Just, like, I, you know, I'm using a, a pretty good camera whenever I'm doing anything, and I'm horrible at photography, so... Every time I see somebody who can do it well, I'm always a little bit jealous. <laughs> but like, I look at the picture you have your sample for your green jades, and they're vibrant. Yeah, very vibrant color. So, how I guess what I say is, how hard is it for someone to keep them that way? Is it a high color? Is it just because you're re- have been so careful about sourcing them? that you're getting this much more vibrant color as opposed to that kind of like the more drab olive color that I tend to see. So, so a little bit disclaimer. So green, green jades are really hard to breed true because they're, you know, they're a new kid on the block. Mm-hmm. So when we get them in, you know, we get, we get, you know, a little bit different shades of green, right? But they are, they're all opaque. They're all not translucent, right? Like how the lower grade green, green jades are. Yeah. Um, so, we we handpick every single, you know, shrimp just to make sure that the color is kind of what was depicted on our website, um, so that our customer receives you know, good great quality green jades. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's it's the sourcing that we've been able to find you know, a good a good source of them. Uh, I'm not gonna take credit of you know breeding breeding them ourselves because because total disclaimer we don't. It takes many, 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 many years, of, you know, to to achieve a, a stable line mm-hmm. um, like that. Um, but through through sourcing, we found a, a good supplier that that uh, that has that grade of green. Um, but also, green jays are really finicky, in a sense okay. that you know they 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 look a certain color on on one substrate, they look blue on one substrate, they look you know, green on one substrate, they look you know a little bit they look black on certain light, and they put white light on them, they're green. So. Um, so they're they're a little bit finicky that way, um, but with 
and also after they molt, they kind of look look a little bit, you know, they, they turn blue, and then after the the shell harms up, they, they become green again. So after, we, we, yeah. So so compared to all the all the nails, they're kind of the most finicky. Um, but uh, with with the right lighting, with the right substrate, um, they they really pop. Uh, and that's that's kind of what the photo. Um, it's just it's just me kind of playing around with the different substrate, different lighting, um, to kind of get them to show show their true um, true color. Yeah, and that kind of what you potentially can have if you take that have, time yeah. to set them up right. Right, right. Exactly. Very cool. So let's go into the Caradina. Yep. And uh, we talked about this a little bit. And I, and, and, and maybe it's just because the name really entices me. Let's talk yeah. about the Dragon Bloods. Yeah. Because these things are pretty wild looking. Yeah, they're pretty cool. So the Dragon Blood line is kind of, I guess, my personal line so i got them from uh, a breeder so i didn't create the line full disclaimer so dragon bloods are originally from from germany from a german breeder um so dragon bloods actually come in red and they also come in black so they have they call them red the red calcios and the black calcios and the the dragon bloods are really the blue calcio but they have a cool name because you know they they have a you know they kind of <laughs> looks like dragon blood so um when when i got the line. My goal, initial goal, was you know most dragon bloods come in a little bit white with a little bit of black, with splash of blue on them. My goal for that, um, to the tank as a hobbyist, was to create a blue of dragon blood that that I could create. Um, so it's just kind of just culling, you know, spending time culling them and, and maintaining the, the the color that is desirable to, to me. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of why the dragon bloods that that we have are a little bit, you know, they're a lot more blue than than what what folks possibly can find from others other suppliers yeah it just it just because that that's what's cool looking to me um so that's I kind mean, of my, my i can't and i mean the picture's up on the screen so you know folks will say in the comments uh their opinions but this is like when i was kind of scouting after we, we did very briefly started to talk and like you're yeah. like oh yeah here's my website if you want to take a look um, and i was like i went to caradina because i'm always curious as someone who doesn't keep Caradina but likes the way a lot of them look. Like, I love crystal shrimp. I think they're really, really gorgeous. And white yeah. and the shrimp is very cool. Right. I'm scrolling down. I'm like, oh, yeah. Pinto, what? Dragon blood. What the heck is... Th-? All right, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> this is about the about the way that my brain clicked. It's just like, yeah. that's a pretty wicked looking little shrimp. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're definitely one of my favorites, too. They're pretty cool. Okay. Last one. And this is this is the, the true new kid. Right. Um, from what I understand, because there's one other uh, person in the Seattle area who's pretty good with this particular shrimp. Yeah. These are pretty finicky, and that's the Sulawesi's. Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. How long, let's just start with first, how long have you been doing Sulawesi? Because you've really, you've done shrimp in total about five years, but Sulawesi are pretty new to the u.s in the grand scheme of things from my understanding but i'm i'm a rainbow fish guy so what do i actually know right <laughs> right well there's a lot of sulawesi yeah they have they've been kind of they've been pretty new um in the states um i guess like one you mentioned they're finicky so it's harder for for a lot of hobbyists to you know get a colony going but once you get a colony going once you get the parameters right like most shrimp they go crazy they breed like crazy in your tank so um i guess I've been I've been playing around the Sulawesi for a year and a half I think. Okay. A year and a half, close, close to two years. Um, so not very long. Uh, but but like I guess like most things, I I can I kind of dive into the weeds and get into the details pretty early to try to figure them out. So um, we got a, we got a couple of colonies of them going pretty well for us. Um, and the cool thing about it is we we keep them in. Um. We keep them in just regular new parameters, nothing, nothing special. Um, oh wow! Yeah, so most most uh, breeders keep them in you know higher pH water, um, which which is which also will work. Um, that's kind of what most most folks do who breed them. But um, but I, yeah, they the the white socks. I would say that the white socks because they've been around the longest. They're the the line is the hardiest among all of them, and there's so many of them. That we um, we we be able to figure out how to keep them in just regular new parameters. So I did that just one so that most that folks can get into that shrimp easier. Mm-hmm. They don't need anything 
special. They just need, you know, if you keep Neos, you can keep Zulu AC. Um, you just need to put a heater in there uh, because they like warmer temperatures, 78 to 84 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so that's the, that's the reasoning why I kind of went in that direction. Yeah, and we'll we'll definitely cover more details in the, the yeah. next video when it comes to being successful because I that's just one of the shrimp where like they look so cool, and and that's just like that's the common Sulawesi at this point. There are some other ones out there that are real wild, but um, mm -hmm. even the common one looks incredible. So being able to be successful mm -hmm. with those, I think, is going to be. I guess like to me, that's the thing that's going to be the next kind of rage in yeah. shrimp is like keep moving on to seeing more and more people start to try and su be successful with the solo aces because they just, they mm -hmm. look so neat, especially those big, the super long, obvious, yeah. you know, the little, little whiskers, as I like to call them that they've got yeah. compared to say like Neos where they're, they got them, but right. they're a little shorter. They're not quite as crazy. Right. All right. Yeah, well, cool. I think, I think we've, we've talked quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you so much, Nick. Uh, just what I'd really love to hear from all the folks that are watching down in the comments below, uh, you know, of, of what we talked about, what, what's most interesting to you, what kind of perked your ear right away or, or is a similar story to you? Let me know down in the comments. I really want to know if you've enjoyed this short chat with Nick, getting an understanding of how a guy basically in five years goes from, I'm just starting to keep shrimp to running a successful business to where he could quit his job as a chemical engineer for a gas company which to me that's the incredible side of the story because that's that's quick but it's it's not really five years right it's basically a, your entire life up to this point slowly working toward that point mm -hmm. in the grand mm -hmm. scheme of things uh but right. yeah give it a little like all the youtube magic stuff you guys know the drill i hate doing the youtube stuff <laughs> I, hate, I hate all that stuff but you gotta you just gotta but uh right. for those that haven't you know, we've had the, there's a link down in the description below. It's, it's been tagged all over the place. It's underneath the video here, the magic of editing. Go check out Nick's site, shrimpybusiness.com. He's got some really cool stuff. He sells a lot of awesome products that we'll talk about in the next video because some of them might be just the thing you need to be successful with shrimp that, like me, I've been horribly bad with shrimp in the past. And we're going to try and fix that. So as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and stay awesome.